Hi guys and welcome back to the Bronte Book Club. For today's video we are going to be discussing Wuthering Heights which we've been reading for the past two months in January and February. This is the first cycle of the book club so today's video is really testing out the format so if there are any suggestions of ways you'd like to discuss the books in the future I'd really love to know. But today I am going to be talking about Wuthering Heights, talking about my read of it, how I interpret it, the themes in there but not in an academic jargony way. I just want to talk about it, how I view the book and I'd also love to discuss with you both in the comments and over on the Goodreads group what Wuthering Heights means to you, how you read it and different interpretations you have. I'm going to be asking questions throughout the video and answering them myself and I'd also love to know your answers to the questions that I pose and I really hope that whether you liked Wuthering Heights, whether you didn't like it when you read it, that we could have a big discussion on it because I think that's what reading books is all about. So Wuthering Heights was published in 1847 under the name Ellis Bell, but all the way back in Yorkshire in Haworth, Emily Bronte had spent the past year writing it and it was a book that would cause a lot of controversy when it was published, that would be called coarse and immoral and would be criticised for its themes and it's a book that continues to fascinate even today and as I read it I realised really how shocking it would have been because there were parts that I read that I found really shocking, particularly the scene when Catherine talks about denying heaven and how she's going to speak spend her death on earth where she belongs and all this talk of Satan and hell and things were just so shocking and you read other Victorian novels and there are themes featured in Wuthering Heights that just aren't featured in any other Victorian book I've read and that's why I love it so much. So I originally read Wuthering Heights back in 2015 and fell completely in love with it. I read it at a time when I was quite down in a really bad place and so it was quite comforting to read a book where bad things things happened and it was quite depressing and I felt when I read it that I wasn't alone, that it was okay to feel really low and looking back now I realise that it was Wuthering Heights that really did make me feel like I was less alone in my feelings and gave me something to really focus on which I think is why I love the Brontes so much and why they mean so much to me is that they gave me something to cling on to and I think Wuthering Heights is a really good book for that. I've heard a lot of you say that you didn't love Wuthering Heights when you read it, some of you read it this time and didn't like it which is fair enough. I do think it's a Marmite book. You either love it or you hate it. Some of you have also said that you didn't like it the first time but this second time you did really enjoy it and my read, read was a bit different. I loved it the first time and I loved it so passionately but this time I really got to explore the book in depth which I don't think I did the first time and it was really nice to analyse it more this time that I read it and to see the inner workings of Emily's mind as she would have written it and to see well why did you write it this way? Why did you choose to do this? And also how would it have been received and how would these certain scenes make this bigger picture of something that was really immoral? One of the themes I really picked up on in this reading was the differences between fact and fiction in the book. How through the narrators and through certain moments in the book you're not sure which is true and which is false and I love that about it and how it makes it so much more complex. For example, if we look at the narrators of Lockwood and Nellie Dean, we're not really sure if they're telling the truth the whole time or how truthful their statements are. So as you go through the book and find out more about Lockwood and more about Nellie and how they are with the characters, you do question the book and you question the narration as a whole and I loved that about it. It reminded me of books like Frankenstein and it really does conform to this gothic period. So for Frankenstein it is told in letter form and also by a sailor and you get this very interesting narrative and Wuthering Heights is a bit like that in that the central characters aren't the narrators. In fact I would go so far as to say that the only moment during the book that we can 100% trust or near 100% trust is Isabella Linton's letter or Isabella Heathcliff at this time. This is something that is told from her eyes, is told by her and is telling her truth as she sees it and is something that Nellie actually reads to Lockwood. So other parts of the book are told from Lockwood to Nellie and then Nellie narrating on something that Heathcliff said who is narrating on something that Cathy said and so on and so forth and so you get this puzzle 
of narration that you have to cipher and look at through everybody's eyes. So are Lockwood and Nellie Dean reliable narrators? I'd love to know your opinion. But I am going to say a mixture of both. Lockwood, for example, doesn't have the bias or the attachment that Nelly has, but he also has this relationship or this supposed relationship with Kathy going on, the young Kathy, who he thinks that he could marry one day and he sees her as this very beautiful woman. And so you see the narration from his eyes as he views her and as he views her in this very positive light because he wants to marry her and he has this history with ladies. The reason that he goes to Yorkshire and goes to Thrushcross Grange is because he's kind of escaping this woman who this kind of romance was going on between them but it was very one-sided and so he got away from that and we see him as this hopeless romantic type figure. And then Nellie on the other hand is so close to the characters and really loves them but also hates them at the same time. So you see this as you look at Catherine Earnshaw the older because Emily does not make names easy. You see this because Nellie has grown up with her, she's looking after her and she at once loves her but also despises her and doesn't like the person that she is. And Catherine is so controlling and I think you see this at so many points during the book. Even after her death, she controls Heathcliff. She is this figure that dictates his life and I love that about Catherine. But when we look at Nellie, you can almost see at points that her allegiance changes and so the narration changes at the same time. The narration is also unreliable because of the passing of time. So the book starts in 1801 when Lockwood is there and then goes back in time and then Lockwood goes back and then he discovers more of the story and then goes back again and finds out the story from a different perspective and so the perspective is always changing because the passing of time is always going to change how we view events. For example, I'm filming this video now now, and now I can remember exactly what I'm saying. But if I go 10 years into the future, I'm not going to be able to remember word for word what I said. Of course not, my brain just does not have the capacity for that. And so when we look at Nellie as a character and we look at the way that Emily has constructed her, you question how much the narrative is supposed to be in the moment and how much of it is supposed to be this retelling of a story that is never gonna be the exact truth as it was. Another question I think it's really important to consider when reading Wuthering Heights, is Wuthering Heights a romance? I don't think we'll ever get to the kernel of truth in this question and we're never gonna be able to get into Emily's mind and what she intended when writing it. But I think this is one of the reasons that people don't like Wuthering Heights is because they see it as this epic romance and then they read it and look at the words on the page and it's very hard to find any kind of romance going on. And I loved the way that Heathcliff described the reaction that people have to him. And I think it's really relevant to the way that we view Heathcliff today. So Heathcliff says to Nellie in relation to Isabella and why Isabella fell head over heels in love with him, even though she didn't really know him. He says, she abandoned them under a delusion, picturing in me a hero of romance and expecting unlimited indulgences from my chivalrous devotion. I can hardly regard her in the light of a rational creature so obstinately has she persisted in forming a fabulous notion of my character and acting on the false impressions she cherished. And I just read that and thought this is why so many people see Heathcliff as this amazing heroic figure, somebody who is really romantic and attractive and beautiful and has all these heroic things. When in reality, it's so hard to see that kind of character on the page. And Emily writes him so fascinatingly because it's almost like she sees this reaction to Heathcliff and preempts it and says well actually this isn't how you should be viewing Heathcliff this is how he should be viewed as a flawed character as someone who is out for revenge who makes often the wrong decisions but is human at the heart too and I love that about him I love Heathcliff even though I hate him as a character construction he is brilliant but as a human being as a person don't really like him would probably be very scared of him because of the actions that he undertakes and the things he does during the book that are very questionable. This also plays back into the idea of fact versus fiction because the way that we interpret the book is often not how the book is actually written and so every reader who reads Wuthering Heights is gonna take something else from it. And we can also see this in the ghosts. I'd love to know what you think about the ghosts being real. Personally, I think the ghosts are real 
they are something that are physical embodiments of their characters and I think there's something nice and almost comforting about knowing that Heathcliff and Catherine ended up together in this tumultuous relationship that they have. They are the only two people who really fully understand each other in a way that Edgar Linton for example just doesn't have that attachment, doesn't have that characteristics in his personality that enable him to live a life that is very much not over once you're dead. Edgar, I'm sure, is having a wonderful time up in heaven, but Catherine and Heathcliff are so tied to the landscape and to their environment that Edgar could be placed in any book or any environment and he would be the same person. But Catherine and Heathcliff rely so much on the moors and so much on Wuthering Heights. Also something interesting about Heathcliff is who is he? Where does he come from? He emerges out of nowhere and I've heard very different interpretations on this, such as Heathcliff is a figure who seeks revenge on slavery. That is one take I've heard. Other takes as well are very valid. I'm not really sure where I sit on this one. I think it would take another read for me, a very deep analytical read, to figure out what I think about Heathcliff because I think it's always changing throughout the narrative. But I also think it's interesting to look at adaptations of Heathcliff and how that has also fed into our idea of him as a romantic figure. We'll never know exactly how Emily envisaged him, but I think as time goes on, critical analysis of Wuthering Heights is unearthing a Heathcliff who has hasn't been seen before and maybe was intended to be seen but has been hidden away for a long time ever since the book was written. So what are the major themes in Wuthering Heights? I've chosen a few that I'd like to talk about, the major one being revenge because obviously Heathcliff's main motive during the book is to seek revenge on those people who have wronged him and this often isn't the obvious ways either. So you see Hareton and you see Hindley and his reaction to them how he hates Hindley with a passion because of the way that Hindley has treated him and so he wants to seek revenge on him to avenge the wrongs that have been done to him. But at the same time we have Hareton and he seems to really love Hareton. I would say that Hareton is the character in the book who really understands Heathcliff and I think that's why I love Hareton as a character so much. Heathcliff talks in the book about how he wishes that Hareton was his son instead of Linton Heathcliff and I think that that is just so interesting to look at and something I'm going to be thinking about a lot in future readings as well. Heathcliff as this quite paternal figure even though he really wrongs Hareton, but ultimately I don't think that Hareton ended up in a bad way. Another less obvious theme is the work of future generations and how you see through the different generations of characters in the books how things are changing. So you have the original characters, Heathcliff, Catherine, Isabella and Edgar, then you have their children and I think you see Cathy, the younger, and you see Hareton and how actually the end of the book is very hopeful. So whilst Wuthering Heights is quite a sad book at times, quite haunting, you have this very uplifting ending and I read it this time round and I just felt so uplifted at the end and how Cathy and Hareton are actually going to make something of their futures and how they are the future of Wuthering Heights and they're going to change the narrative of their family's histories and I just love that about it and I really liked that look at how generational changes can affect the course of the book. Class is also a major, major theme in the book and something that really motivates the characters. For example, if we look at Catherine, the older, we can see that her decision to marry Edgar is because he is more wealthy, he is the better option out of him and Heathcliff. And I don't think there's anything wrong with Cathy for that. I think that that is a decision that is very much based on her situation and the ideals of the day. You have to marry to progress and that's really the only option that women have. And you also see this repeating itself in Cathy, the younger, just to reiterate which Cathy and which Catherine is which because it is so confusing and as I read the book I'm like which character is this again? So you see this when Cathy marries Linton Heathcliff and you question in the book whether this is the right thing. Linton is such a horrible character, so whiny and whingy, I just want to shake him at times but also you can see why Cathy is doing it because he is this really good option to marry and also marriage is one of the only choices a woman can make and it's one of the only options she has and so 
there's no reason why Kathy shouldn't be like, okay, I'm gonna marry him, even though it goes against everything that everyone else wants. It is a decision that she makes and that she's very set on doing. I think it's impossible to read Wuthering Heights and not consider religion and how much of an effect that has on the plot. And you have the figure of Joseph as well. I love Joseph as a character, even though I don't understand him at points, even though he doesn't really add anything to the plot. I think there is a very much a difference between Joseph and the other characters, particularly Heathcliff and Catherine and how they are very much pagan in their motives and Joseph is very Christian and very very religious and the way that those characters interact and the ties that Joseph has to Wuthering Heights and the ties that Catherine has to Wuthering Heights even after her death. I think it is that that makes this book so shocking because there are two very conflicting ideas of religion. Also, we can't do a Wuthering Heights book talk without talking about that scene where Heathcliff digs up Catherine and what? What is that scene? It's so creepy and so disturbing, but also fits so brilliantly with the book that you can't not love it. You can't read it without thinking that it is a stroke of genius because who else would have had the courage and bravery to write a scene like that? I don't know, but Emily pulls it off so fantastically and I just love it. In a weird way, I don't love reading it. It makes shivers run down my spine, but also it's just fantastic as well. So who were my favorite characters this time round? I've still got a huge soft spot for Edgar Linton. I love him. I just wanna give him a big hug. I feel like he's one of the best characters in the book because Kathy infuriates me at times. I probably wouldn't make some of the decisions that she does, but I feel like Edgar is one of those characters who just wasn't meant to be in this book. He was meant to have a really peaceful life, he wasn't meant to marry Catherine, and he's so proud of her, he really loves her, and their love is something that is very different in contrast to Catherine and Heathcliff's love. And also, you have this very paternal bond between him and Cathy, and I just think that's so, so special. I also really loved Hareton this time round. I've got a soft spot for him as well, because it is down to his circumstances that he is like he is. It's not through any fault of his own, and you see at the end of the book this glimmer of hope in his eyes that the future holds something very special for him and Kathy. and I loved the concluding chapter where everything goes really well and you have this burgeoning romance between Kathy and Hareton and it really is the best happy ever after because the rest of the book has been so awful that you just need that bit of respite, that glimmer of hope that makes you think, yes, this book was so worth it. I would love to hear all about your Wuthering Heights thoughts, either in the comments or in the Goodreads group, which I will link in the description. There are really good conversations going on there. I love checking in. There are an introduction page and discussion forums where you can talk about Wuthering Heights and adaptations. And that's where the bulk of discussion are going on at the moment. But I'll also be responding to comments here and also on the Goodreads page. So lots of different places that you can discuss the book. In March and April, we are going to be reading Agnes Grey. And I'm so excited to read this book because this is the book that was published at the same time as Wuthering Heights. So as you read Agnes Grey in the next few months, consider what it would be like to go from reading Wuthering Heights to then going to Agnes Grey. It's a bit of a change, but I really hope you enjoy Agnes Grey. And the next video will be up later this month. And then next month in April, we will be discussing Agnes Grey in full. And I'll also be opening up forum pages on the book in the next few weeks. So if you have already read it, then you can also go over to the Goodreads page then and start discussing the book. Like I said at the start, this is the first book club discussion so if you've got any suggestions on ways you'd like this to run later in the year I'd really love to hear your feedback because this is an ongoing project and has lots of room to grow so I'm definitely on board for all your suggestions on ways that you'd like me to discuss further or other things you'd like to bring into the conversation. I really hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you guys soon. Happy reading!